By watching or listening to this show, you are acknowledging that you are of legal age to purchase and consume cannabis in your region. This production is for adults only. Welcome to the Cannabis 101 Podcast, part of the Cannabis Life Experience, your guide through the legalization and consumption of cannabis in Canada and beyond. Join us on this journey and adventure with the wonderful plant. Here's your host, Dean Millard. Hello there and welcome to episode 90, hour number two of the Cannabis 101 podcast. Hour number one comes out on Tuesday mornings featuring David Wiley of this week, uh, for this week in Cannabis News of Okanagan Z and Malka LaBelle from the Green Generation Co. on the business of cannabis. We also do uh, Weed Word of the Day, give you some slang and standard terms and also have some fun with cannabis characters and the cannabis question, which we will get to on this show as well. But there's one way that we start things off on this program, and that's by asking, what's your groove? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Can you dig it? Kind of grabs you by the boo-boo, don't it? This is great. This is the bee's knees. So if you're new to the program, what I mean by what's your groove is what are you going with when it comes to cannabis while listening to the show? If you are joint bong. Uh, edible drink, just some nice relaxing CBD, um, some other cannabinoid uh, that we don't don't know a whole lot about. Please let me know if you are that far ahead of the curve. Uh, I have with me the Slash from Stonesmiths, as I mentioned on hour one. Um, They're taking a bit of a break from being a cannabis company. I don't know what the future is. Uh, We appreciated them being around when they were because this is an awesome product. We may be able to get our hands on a few uh, to give away in the next little while. But I love it. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, you could check out past episodes, but the really cool thing about this is the built-in loader. That's just the, the excellent thing about this. You just scoop in um, or you just, you know, in this case, I've got uh, a shatter from Dabods uh, from Stigma Grow. You just touch it right onto the piece of shatter that you want, put it in there, and boom, away you go. So let me get my groove on with Dabods uh, shatter. Um They have an indica and a uh, sativa. Oh, there's uh, not much left of that one. Uh, I'll have to refill that as I go. I think my battery's also dying with that as well. So that's what I am grooving with. Uh, Would love to hear what you're grooving with. Hit me up on Twitter at the cannabis. 101 or you can email me at cannabis 101 podcast at gmail.com here is what's coming down the hash pipe on this episode dan shapiro is going to join me this is a really fun conversation if, if you are a fan of sports entertainment and cannabis or just one of the three you'll enjoy it he's the associate general counsel with green lane uh, a really cool cannabis company that distributes a lot of the uh, great products that you like uh, the packs uh, right there uh, they distribute that so uh, oh, as well as a whole host of other companies that they uh, represent so we're going to chat with him a little bit about what they do at green lane but a little bit about um, the, the marriage between cannabis sports and entertainment and how the law sees it and, and how it might be moving forward so a very very enlightening and interesting conversation certainly educational for me as well and we're going to continue the conversation on thursday uh that would be the 15th of uh, april depending on when you're listening to this uh on relevant on the cannabis 101 podcast vibe 
at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, 3.30 p.m. Mountain Time, 2.30 Pacific. So we will chat with Dan a little bit more on that uh, app, on that platform. You can download the app. Just search for Relevant, R-E-L-E-V-N-T, and then find the Cannabis 101 Podcast vibe. So Dan will join us on the show today. Also, Chris Ionson, of course, our educator and the regional manager with Plant Life Cannabis. We're doing strawberry glue from Namaste on the program. Delicious. Our cannabis question is about vapes. We'll tell you what pairs well with cannabis, at least in my opinion. And we'll tell you about the Weed Weekly as well. Uh, We have a uh, giveaway every week uh, that uh, just comes right into your inbox. Not the giveaway, but the newsletter comes right into your inbox and you can win a prize as we spin the wheel of names. Right now, though, let's get to it. It's our cannabis question. It's prize time. (laughs) Chime in on the cannabis question. Okay. And you could win a Cannabis 101 podcast prize pack. Pipe and a grape, bong and a blint. Hit us up on any of our social media feeds or email us at Cannabis101podcast at gmail.com. Okay, here we go. So what I'm asking this week is, what is your favorite vaporizing accessory? Um, not the actual, uh, what cultivar do you like to uh, vape? Um, you know, what has the best flavor? But what, what actual either vape pen uh, or device do you love to use? If you're watching on the screen, you can see the ways to get in touch with us. If you're listening, thank you very much. If you want to check it out. We have a YouTube channel, Cannabis 101 Podcast. But you can hit us up uh, on Twitter, at the Cannabis 101. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram, Cannabis 101 Podcast. And you can email me, Cannabis101Podcast at gmail.com. If you would like to stay anonymous, you can do that and still win a prize. But just please let me know ahead of time because we do read some of these on the air. Uh, in fact, I got a really good response uh, from a, uh, a bud tender, actually, that uh, listens uh, to the program. Uh, she's in uh, Lethbridge and uh, said, just, start lis- just started listening to the pod at the beginning of the month. I'm a bud tender in Lethbridge, so it helps to learn a few things. And I wanted to answer my question of the week. My favorite vape accessory is the Utilian. I have one of those. I actually do uh, quite enjoy it from time to time. So, uh, thank you to uh, 138 Shelbean for listening to the program and uh, following along on social media. So uh, my favorite uh, vape accessory right now, it's a tie. Uh, I've got the slash up here that I got my show going with, uh, with the dab bods uh, from Stigma in there. And then I got the Pax Era uh, as well. And uh, I love I, I love this because I get concentrates right in there. I love this because the simplicity. It's a pod. It goes in there. There's no mess, no fuss. Um, you know, you just control it by uh, doing some taps. If you don't have an Apple phone, you can use the uh, the app for that. So, And, and the cool thing is, is that, uh, and this is going to be cool for you, we got ours engraved. Uh, when Chris Ionson was at Nova Cannabis, he had the engraver there. And so I uh, brought my packs down and got it engraved. I actually got uh, some of the other podcasts that I have uh, on there as well. And so the really cool thing is that we're going to have some of these to give away. Uh, Jenna Henderson is uh, the uh, the local sales rep for PAX in Calgary and, and probably Western Canada, I'd imagine. And she, anyway, she's uh, graciously hooked us up with some of these that are engraved. So you'll be able to get your very own Cannabis 101 podcast, uh, PAX Era. And, and they have some cool things uh, coming out as well uh, from PAX. So stay tuned for that. And uh, that's what I'm going with as far as my favorite vape accessories. Just for chiming in at any point on the show, on any of the things that we're asking you, you are entered into the prize draw and we can ship out a, a Cannabis 101 podcast prize pack to you wherever you might be. All right, as for what pairs well with cannabis, I am going with grounding Um, I don't know, maybe you might not know what grounding is. I just found out about it uh, the other day, but that's, it's simple as, as, as technical as I can tell you, it's, it's simple. It's getting on the ground, touching your bare feet 
to the ground, the grass, the dirt, a tree. Um, I, I can't, you know, I, I've been researching this. There's some really impressive science behind it, and it's simple. Think about when you were a kid. You loved to just run around in the sand on the playground in your bare feet. I can't wait to. We, we got a bunch of snow recently, so we're waiting for that to melt, but I can't wait to get out in the grass, take a big joint or my slash or my packs or something, just chill out with some music, maybe my laptop doing some work with my feet on the ground. And it is very, very uh, great and beneficial for inflammation. So cannabis pairs well for me uh, with uh, grounding. And uh, there's, a, there's a really cool movie called, uh, I think it's called The, the Earthing Movie uh, that I found on YouTube where I was able to find out uh, the information uh, that, that I certainly uh, was looking for. Uh, okay, as I mentioned earlier, Dan Sh- uh, Shapiro is going to join us. Uh, Dan Shapiro, rather, is going to join us on uh, Relevant. Uh, make sure you check out uh, the Cannabis 101 podcast vibe at Relevant. Download the app. It's simple. Uh, first step is to download the app and then come check us out at the Cannabis 101 podcast vibe. There's a cool message board, some live audio, audio chats. We did one with David Wiley last week and Dan's going to join us this week. Malka LaBelle will join us at some point. She's always got some interesting stuff. We'll get Chris Ions in and some other bud tenders and you, the audience and, and uh, people that like to listen and watch this show, I want to hear from you as well um, on that particular app. And I want to be able to interact with you in a live way that we can't do here on uh, the actual show. So check it out. Download the app and find the Cannabis 101 podcast vibe on Relevant. And then away you go. All right. We are going to hear from Dan Shapiro right after this pleased to welcome to the program today the Associate General Counsel at Green Lane. Uh, Dan Shapiro is joining us. Dan, thanks very much for being on the program. How are things? Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Things are great. Okay, let's start. Uh, I, I always start uh, with one kind of similar question to every single guest who comes on the show because, you know, for most of us, we did something a little bit different before we got into the cannabis industry, particularly here in Canada where legalization is uh, just over a couple of years old. But what did you do before you joined uh, kind of the cannabis space with Green Lane? So uh, I went to law school out of college. Uh, I'm an attorney. And in law school, I worked for a sports agency called Rock Nation Sports. It's Jay-Z Sports Agency. And after law school, I decided to work in in in-house at a private equity firm. And I worked on a number of different companies within my broader company. And the specialized nature of what I did was really work with highly regulated spaces. So a lot of different financial companies, healthcare, aviation, uh, sports entertainment as well, and realized that I ultimately wanted to move back into more of the sports and entertainment world and, and left to go work for another sports agency called CAA Sports. And I worked there for a year when I realized that cannabis was the future for me. It combined all of the things that I was interested in, whether it was working in highly regulated spaces, whether it was the intersection, which of course we'll talk about with the entertainment and sports world. Uh, It touches into the food world. It's just so multidisciplinary that for me, having the opportunity to jump in at the time, which was uh, about two years ago. And when I started wanting to make the move about two and a half years ago, 
I thought the future was so bright that if I didn't jump in, uh, I might miss the entry point. So I love uh, that, you know, you, you saw a kind of, uh, you know, an opening and combining something that you're really passionate about. Um, but I just want to quickly, you know, I, I worked in the sports media business for 22 plus years. I absolutely loved it. It was great. I got some great memories out of it. But you had the chance to work with two pretty high profile and uh, pretty well-known agencies. I'd imagine as a sports fan yourself, you must have some really, really fun memories and, and you know, some, some great times from that, uh, from your past career. Yeah, I'm a fanatical sports fan and, and I don't use that term lightly. Um, <laughs> And to be able to work for for those types of companies, to work for uh, the agent who I worked for at Rock Nation, her name is uh, Kim Miali. She is fantastic. Uh, I think the best agent in the NFL. I think the results speak for themselves with the deals she's done for Ronnie Stanley, uh, the deals she's done for Saquon Barkley, Des Bryant. Um, and it was an amazing experience. And then to be able to go to CAA and see all of the different things that they were doing from their merchant bank, uh, Evolution Media Capital, that dealt with all of the media rights negotiations that is really going to become, I think, the, the key storyline of the next five years of sports. You saw it recently with the NFL. Um, it, it was really cool for me. And it, it was a dream come true. And I don't think I would have been able to live my life without having at least a couple of years experience doing something like that. Yeah, that's very cool. All right, so we chatted on One Hitters about your uh, first uh, experience with cannabis, and people can uh, check that out. It will come out uh, later this week. But let's just talk about in general, you know, when and why did cannabis become a part of your personal life, you know, after that first time? Some some people have that first time, and then they take a break, and then they come back to it. You know, what was a, what was was when did cannabis become kind of a regular part of your life, and why? So I would say, as I, I mentioned, the first time was uh, in high school. And I would say throughout high school, I continued to consume 98% in the smoking capacity, a little bit in the edible uh, world. But it really was in college where it, it took off to another level. And for me, it was always just about, I was never a huge drinker outside of socially. I was never someone who cracked a beer by themselves, had a drink by themselves to watch a game. That was just nearly never my MO. And for the first time in my life, as I went to college and was away from my, my family and um, ultimately started to live by myself or at least have access to different people's apartments, it just always was something I liked doing. But growing up in Manhattan and in apartment buildings, it's a little trickier to consume and, and you know remember it would be a lot easier right now so this was pre vaporization technology at a high level in any way shape or form this is way before um you know 90 percent of the products that we distribute so you're really looking at a classic water pipe or a classic joint and in apartment buildings when you're 15 16 17 it's a little difficult <laughs> and walking around manhattan um was at the time still about four or five years before the police were told to let it ride a little bit, which culminated in the past month uh, with a full, uh, you know, let it ride um, mantra post legalization. But it, it really just came down to the fact that I I always responded really well to it. I had friends who who had some bad reactions or they didn't like being high because they were antisocial or it made them go to sleep. And for me, I kind of always felt like I knew what I was getting from it. I, it. It had the ability to simultaneously relax me, but I never felt bad the next day afterward. Uh, I could still be social. Uh, I'm very talkative. And, and sometimes I, I like to think that, um, the extra sense or two that I sometimes don't want to say, cannabis will will help me uh, not say. And mm -hmm. as I've gotten older, I, I've I've been able to do it without that. But at the time, I I, I think it sometimes in a weird way matured my uh, discourse by 
by l slowing things down. I was always a very quick speaker. I had a lot to say. I wanted to get my opinion in there. Um, so I think kind of all those things combined to just create an experience for me that I, I always felt very comfortable with. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of people said, you know, both, you know, like years ago, you know, I, I grew up in the, uh, the nineties is when I started using cannabis and people would say, Oh, I smoked and it just made me tired. Well, because we didn't really know anything, uh, about what we were getting. Like, here's the bag of weed. I'm going to go get high. Now we have so much more information about different cultivars, uh, and, and the different, uh, kind of, uh, I guess deter intended, uh, experience, although we're all different, uh, but we do have kind of a generalization and, and so much more information. And you mentioned your home state of New York has gotten on the legalization train. We, we kind of joked on this show that once New York saw New Jersey legalizing, they were like, we don't want to be left behind. We're going to do it. But what took so long in New York, do you think? So the political infighting in New York is ultimately what, what took so long. And there's, there's a difference of opinion uh, which side of the aisle was responsible for it. I, I think both of them were for different reasons. I think ultimately New York, because of Manhattan and because the eye of the world and the eye of the country is often so focused on what New York City and what New York does, it can sometimes create a paralysis that other states don't have because they can move a little bit under the radar. Uh, you don't see sports gambling in, in New York the way you do in other states like New Jersey. Again, just a negligent omission considering how people are living their lives and the economic circumstance in New York currently. So I, I, it really is a political problem. Um, it, there's a difference of opinion on why uh, I think on on the right, uh, political right, there was a reluctance to include the social equity provisions that really needed to be included there. Um, I think on the left, there was sometimes too much focus on unrealistic expectation related to uh, certain taxation allocation and, and certain um, social equity to the degree to which they could do it and, and the timeline. But that all being said, if you put aside the pure economics, I think the result is actually fantastic and, and is better than some other states. Uh, I'm a little worried just because of what happened in Massachusetts and, and New Jersey, and of course, what has happened throughout the West Coast that they might still miss out a little bit. But I think New York City being New York City is going to be able to capitalize on it, even if being a little bit behind. How about where you are right now in uh, Florida? Um, you know, it's um, medical cannabis only from what I understand, but uh, it's it's a uh, it sounds like it's growing. I've talked to a few people in the past and they said it's a pretty good uh, cannabis scene. What do you think of it? It's a great cannabis scene. And I when I first moved to Florida uh, a few years ago, it was very early and it still felt like you were in a illegal state that the quality of what you were getting on the black market wasn't great. It was difficult to get a medical card unless you had certain conditions. And even if you had those conditions, the stigma still surrounded it regarding law enforcement because Florida is ultimately in the South and has stricter drug laws um, than, than a lot of Northeastern and Western states. Now, the medical scene is incredibly robust. I know so many people with medical cards. It is not particularly difficult to get. The Some of the top dispensaries in the U.S. are, are here, whether it's Trulieb, Cureleaf, one plant who I mentioned earlier, who uh, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed their mix of flower product and, and uh, cartridges as well. Uh, move as well as another uh, dispensary and, and everything I just mentioned is within 30 minutes uh, of my house. So it's, it's becoming a really big market. And I also think what, what can't be dismissed too, and, and my company is a good example of it, but there are a few others that doing business in Florida right now and compared to a lot of other states is, is really advantageous to companies. And I think you're going to see whether it's ancillary uh, products like Greenlane or multi-state operators or, or cannabis-focused REITs, so real estate trusts, 
uh, real, uh, cannabis focused investment vehicles, whether it's hedge fund, private equity, et cetera. I think you're going to see a lot of people come down to Florida who aren't even here yet. So I think it's just the beginning. And this is all before we get to um, adult use legalization, which I think people are optimistic can happen um, in 2022. I My general philosophy of all states is I, I'll believe it when I see it and I tack on a year or two beyond what anyone's best estimate is. And if I'm pleasantly surprised, that's great. Um, so we'll see there. On, on the flip side, as I mentioned, it's not legal for adult use yet. Uh, it did not pass the last time around. There is an effort in the state legislature to put THC caps on cannabis products. Does not look like it's going to get through, thankfully. Um, but nonetheless, there is a concerted effort. And uh, Florida's history on criminal justice, whether it's social equity aspect or just criminal justice in general related to drug and otherwise is less than stellar. So it's not all positive, but I think it's moving in the right direction. Excellent. So the website, as we get into Green Lane now, www.gnln.com. And uh, there we go. We're uh, looking at some of the cool stuff that you have. So tell us about Green Lane. What is Green Lane? And particularly, what is your role with Green Lane? So Green Lane is a global ancillary products business. So we do a host of different things. We have a few different verticals, one in particular, and our, our the core of our business is a distribution company for ancillary cannabis products. We are located and based in Boca. We have offices in the Netherlands, California, and in Toronto. And we distribute both B2C and B2B, a number of the products that you see on the screen. They include water pipes, packaging, vaporization technology, a variety of different vaporizer brands. We have a house brand, no, a house brand called Higher Standards, which has two retail locations, one in Malibu and one in New York City. And you can see the logo down there is HS. Uh, right next to it is another house brand of ours called Vibes, which is a rolling paper brand. And it's fascinating. It's a joint venture with the rapper Burner, who is the CEO and founder of Cookies, a major cannabis entrepreneur, huge icon in the space, amazing business partner. And all of the brands that you see on the screen, we either own, distribute, or have a partnership with. And it really touches everything from, uh, as I mentioned, all the different types of vaporization products, the packaging that will sell to multi-state operators, uh, our retail presence. And um, ultimately, we're, we're really a house of brands. We're continuing to build our house brands, which is a higher margin internal brand versus distributing third party. But we also do have a robust distribution and e-com presence. A lot going on, uh, that's for sure. And, you know, we're, we we scrolled through those, uh, the brands, and uh, there is, uh, man, there, there's a lot. And a lot of them that uh, uh, certainly I recognize and uh, that, you know, I actually have the uh, the PAX era up there, and uh, there's a lot of cool. I have the Banana Bros uh, around here somewhere for rolling joints because I can't roll. Right. I, I don't know yeah. what you're like. I can't roll. <laughs> I, just, I just pack cones or use the Banana Bros and things like that. So um, I, I love that you guys work with, uh, you know, not just within the U.S. as well. You know, there's certain, certainly some, some companies that uh, Canadians will recognize. And so you guys aren't just based in the U.S., no, we're we're our main main business is in the United States, but as I mentioned, we have an uh, an office in Canada, and we distribute all throughout Canada uh, a number of our products. The only thing that uh, we don't distribute in Canada uh, is CBD for for uh, regulatory reasons, um, and we distribute throughout Europe. Uh, we distribute in Latin America as well. Uh, of course, all of this is subject to local regulations depending on where you are throughout the world uh, and to fully answer your question my role i'm the associate general counsel so i work for the general counsel of green lane doug fisher who's fantastic uh, he brought me on uh, almost two years ago now 
And I pretty much do a little bit of everything legal for the company. It's just the two of us and our amazing paralegal, Nicole. And we do everything from monitoring the state regulations on a host of our products, from our tobacco products to our hemp derived CBD products to all of our ancillary cannabis products throughout the US, Canada, EU, and a few other areas, depending on where we go. We do licensing endorsement deals for a number of products with uh, entertainers, athletes, uh, certain uh, IP holders like Morally Natural, Keith Haring, Jonathan Adler, the fashion designer and, and homeware designer. Uh, we did a line of cannabis ancillary products with him that we sold through our higher standards brand, which is our retail store and house brand. The stuff is amazing if you're a Jonathan Adler fan at all, uh, or even if you don't know who he is, uh, definitely check out higherstandards.com. There's amazing stuff. And then we do everything from website policies, day-to-day -day legal issues, employment stuff, um, any type of intellectual property, uh, a lot of M&A work managing outside counsel for the host of issues that a company of our size deals with and really anything that can come up on a daily basis. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and as we all know, uh, especially during these times, a lot can just, uh, could just come up on a daily basis. Uh, but something that uh, I, th I was really excited to, to hear about when we first started chatting, uh, I want to talk about now. So tell us what the cannabis division within the American Bar Association Forum on Entertainment and Sports Law Industry is. It, it sounds... Um, I don't know. It, it sounds very exciting to me. I don't know a whole lot about it, but lay it on us because uh, I love uh, when you can combine uh, entertainment, sports, and cannabis, man. So the American Bar Association is the the main trade association that oversees lawyers in the United States, and they set all different types of policy from licensing to continuing legal education and kind of dictates how you have to operate and behave as an attorney. So within the American Bar Association, there are a lot of different forums as subsets that people join as a, a, a little bit more than a hobby, really as a professional trade association. And within those forums, there's leadership for them. So at the end of my first year of law school, I joined the forum on entertainment and sports law as their law student liaison. And I served in that role throughout law school. Upon graduating, I became the membership chair of the forum. So focused on increasing membership, reaching out to young lawyers, uh, different law firms, law students, trying to get them to join the forum, talk about all of the content that we provide. Uh, we have an annual conference in Las Vegas where we have panels and lawyers can get continuing legal education credit, which is a requirement in the US for your bar membership within the state to stay as a licensed lawyer. And I served in that role until about, uh, I guess, four or five months ago, when I was thinking to myself, well, there's no cannabis division at all within the ABA. And that's not limited to within the forum for entertainment and sports, but in general, there's, there is none. There, there are a few smaller panels that existed. There was one small committee related to insurance related issues, uh, but ultimately there was a huge void. So having worked at the time for a little over a year in cannabis and, and my background and passion for sports and entertainment and my role within the ABA, I went to the rest of our board and proposed that we need to get ahead of what's happening with cannabis. There is a lot to be discussed from a legal perspective at the intersection of sports and entertainment. I, I would love to move on from my role as membership chair and start this division. We can be the first division within the ABA. We can do something unique within our forum that's ours. And for me, selfishly, I get to create more content and pursue from an intellectual perspective something I'm passionate about. 
It's interesting when when most people think uh, when they hear the words cannabis and law, they just think it, you know jail time or something like that's the thing that pops into people's mind. Has has you know being in cannabis law right now is it like forging ahead through this brave new world or has it always kind of been around? But maybe it's in the forefront now because you know Canada has legalized, Mexico is looking to. I think there's only 14 states that don't have some sort of uh, medical or recreational legalization within the U.S. You know what is is cannabis law like right now? So it's complete new world uh, on a daily basis. Honestly, on a on a on a hourly basis, <laughs> there there are certain aspects. So similarly to my my past in sports law, main thing with sports law, sim, people always think sports law. You're the general manager of a hockey team, or the general manager of a basketball team, or you're drafting a Nike endorsement deal, mm-hmm. and those are subsets. But there's also sports-related mergers and acquisitions, sports-related employment law, sports-related insurance law. So similarly to that, cannabis is a business, and every business has a lot of different types of law within it. The difference with cannabis, though, from everything else is what you described. But in the U.S., which is a bit different than Canada, or not a bit, it's very different than Canada, it's federally illegal. So I think to the average person, That means, well, if I'm consuming, then I'm breaking the law. And what are the criminal justice uh, results that could come from that? But what that also means is anything related to banking, real estate, insurance are complicated. So any transaction that you're dealing with, it's just going to be a little bit more complicated. That doesn't even take into account the regulatory changes. That doesn't take into account, as you mentioned, interacting in Canada, which is a whole other host of legal issues, some of which are a lot more positive than the U.S., federally legal, some of which are a little more complicated with some of the provincial differences and some of the lack of alignment between them. And then you have the EU where... For the most part, it is not very cannabis friendly. It's not very hemp derived CBD friendly. And in certain countries, not very uh, uh, tobacco product friendly either. So for me, balancing all of that is difficult from a legal perspective because it's not stationary. And I think the way that American lawyers are taught to operate is to make decisions based on precedent And what that means is, how has it been done in the past? And are you comparing your facts to the situation there to the extent they're similar and it's advantageous to you? You can decide that way. And to the extent it's different, you adopt slightly different opinion or result based on. Problem here is there's really not similar facts. The, The most comparable thing you could look at is the alcohol industry in the early 1900s. Tobacco is not remotely comparable in the United States. It's been a staple of the American economy for years. Um, Everyone likes to compare consumer packaged good business to shoes or apparel or food. And there are similarities from a legal perspective and distribution and things like that. But for the most part, you're working within a fixed framework. my frame, the framework I'm working within changes every week. <laughs> okay, so ha- having said that, because it is so fluid, how does that um, impact the athlete, uh, the entertainer uh, involvement in the industry? You know, we know here in Canada there can be no celebrity endorsement. So Seth Rogen, who owns his own cannabis company, can't actually endorse his own cannabis company as Seth Rogen, the celebrity. Um, I don't know if it's different for Seth Rogen, the actual person, but uh, it is what it is. So how does that impact the entertainers, the athletes that do want to get involved in this? So I think entertainers and athletes there's a distinction to be made so i'll start with athletes which is a little bit more tied to the illegal component and with athletes in all of their contracts whether it's their playing contract with the the Rangers, the yankees the jets etc a lot of times they'll have certain clauses, morality clauses within their agreements that can impact their guaranteed money. Historically, 
you would be very hesitant to even deal with any type of daily fantasy sports, any type of alcohol, certainly not cannabis. Now you're starting to see athletes become a lot more comfortable working with the DraftKings as the leagues themselves are, working with a fan duel. Um, the NFL, for example, has amended its rules related to NFL sponsored beer companies, not wine or spirits. And um, there's language around what you can and can't do. You have to be six or more athletes. Uh, you can't technically be endorsing the product, but you can kind of be around the product. So with cannabis, all of that framework of kind of trying to prevent you from doing anything that's going to upset your contract is really the main deterrent for some of these athletes. That also is particularly true with the endorsement deals. So by no means an accurate comparison, but just in terms from a contractual perspective, Nike has suspended its agreement with Deshaun Watson, who is being accused of sexual assault. Now, where we stand today, comparing public cannabis use or endorsement to sexual assault is completely insane. Seven to 10 years ago from a lot of these companies, while the degree to which you're doing something that's going to upset them, it's not comparable, of course, mm -hmm. but from a contractual termination perspective, it certainly could fall under that. And I think now with the way that cannabis is being talked about in the public eye, you're going to see less and less of those clauses, including cannabis. I think you're going to see those clauses excluding certain cannabis products. You're seeing it already. Patrick Reed in the Masters this weekend is sponsored by CBDMD, mm -hmm. a, a hemp derived CBD company. And I think you're going to see a lot of it moving forward, but kind of bringing it first a full circle, the main thing that all of these athletes are going to be cognizant of is their guaranteed money and their endorsement deals and their contracts and making sure that they're not violating what the league is expecting of them and what their brand partners are expecting of them. On the entertainer side, oh no, go ahead. No, no, that, that's fine. That, go ahead. Uh, keep going. On, on the entertainer side, you really have seen a good amount of people uh, get into the space over the last few years and, and really hasn't been too deterred because there's the way that a musician or an actor or someone like a Martha Stewart can operate is a little bit more free than the athlete just because they are kind of their own person. They're not really tied to a league. They're the way sponsorships exist like that does, does happen um, to an extent with certain entertainers. There, there are entertainers who, are so much the focal point of an ad campaign or a company um, that I'm sure conversations need to be had to an extent about what you're gonna do. Uh, but, but I don't think for the most part, particularly now, you're gonna see too many entertainers deterred from working in cannabis because of federal illegality. And in the last six months, you've seen countless musicians in particular actors get involved the way that you had uh, George Clooney get involved with tequila and Ryan Reynolds get involved in gin, LeBron James get involved in tequila. Um, I, I think you're going to see more and more of that moving forward. You know, it's it's interesting when you kind of talk about, uh, you know, there, there is obviously no comparison to sexual assault in cannabis and how that would be looked at differently today. I remember uh, the night Laramie Tunsil dropped in the NFL draft because that uh, gas mask bong pitcher came out. I almost wonder if, if that happened today, if the, if a player wouldn't drop as much, if, if the NFL teams would be like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. We most, you know, we most, uh, we know a lot of players today uh, use cannabis for for, for that and you know it's just interesting to see the the kind of the the perception changing a little bit and and, and that kind of leads us to why it's important to have athletes um you know promoting responsible and safe products and, and cannabis use why is that important in your opinion absolutely so i think first just one one comment on the laramie tunsil issue I think if you asked a lot of NFL teams, if that were to happen now, what their issue would be with it, it would be tied to the fact that they test for cannabis and will suspend players for cannabis use. So from their perspective, I think it's less of an individual indictment on cannabis and more of if I'm investing millions of dollars, I don't want to be worried that you're going to not be available because of your cannabis use. And we can talk about 
how ridiculous that is and, and mm-hmm. my opinion on what the league should do. And um, But in terms of why it's important for athletes, I think there's a few reasons. I think number one, removing the stigma around cannabis is massive. Athletes are the most physically gifted, accomplished people from a from a public facing perspective. So you you do not have more physically fit active people in the public spotlight than professional athletes. And historically, the stigma around cannabis is that you're lazy, you don't do anything, you're you don't you don't achieve things, you're not hardworking, you're not motivated. So to me, there's no better person on the planet than a male or female professional athlete who gets behind the fact that they consume cannabis. I think the second part of the stigma is also around the medical aspect and ties a little bit into what I was alluding to at the NFL, where athletes from a pain management perspective consume cannabis. They have for decades, they will for decades, they do now independent of testing. What I would love to see happen is organizations in these leagues and the leagues themselves adopt cannabis as an alternative to the opioids that these players have been forced to take. And I think that aspect too, through athletes with the United States in particular, dealing with such a severe opioid crisis, athletes can be at the forefront of saying, I have pain, I had a surgery, a back surgery, a knee surgery, like a lot of average Americans do. And that's ultimately the main catalyst for a lot of addiction in the United States is some type of innocent surgery. And I can consume cannabis and it's going to help me. And I'm 6'4", 250 pounds. I tore my knee into 50 pieces and I can consume cannabis and I don't need to take these pills. Mm -hmm. And if people can and and people, you know, you're you're a huge sports fan, so you fully understand it. But to, to those who aren't. People really listen to athletes in, in a unique way. They're, they're some of the few remaining people that are in your life on a very regular basis. No one really watches all the same shows anymore. Even the most popular TV shows, the numbers are you know pale in comparison to 15 years ago. Most popular movies, not everyone watches it. But your sports teams within your city, within the country, I mean, those, those are the highest rated cable TV shows still. It is still a seminal water cooler moment, sports moments. And I think that's really, number one, the stigma, both from a historical cannabis stigma, also from a health perspective. I think number two is the access to capital that athletes have, Mm -hmm. and not just financial capital, but political capital. I think there are a few people who have the positive image in the public that I just described that also has access to the financial world, both their own financial success. And there is a huge synergy emerging over the last five years between venture capital and athletes, venture capital entertainers, um, but also the political capital. Sports team owners are very connected. A lot of athletes themselves are connected to politicians. A lot of NBA players are very close with Barack Obama and have been uh, for a few years. Chris Paul is very, very close with Bob Iger, and they developed a friendship that is reminiscent of a mentor-mentee because Chris Paul wanted to seek out someone that he respected in the business world. And I think there's not that many different types of people who have the ability to reach all of those different worlds and come together for positive change, whether it's for legalization or for, and I think in a lot of ways, more importantly, from a criminal justice and social equity component, I think that moves into the third point for for why I think athletes in particular and entertainers as well have such a big role in promoting cannabis and why it's so important is that, again, with all the capital they have, all the recognition they have, and all the trust from the public they have, a lot of them are also connected firsthand to these communities that have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. And whether, depending on which type of community you came from, whether it was inner city, whether it was rural, all of these athletes come from varying places around the world, not just the United States, come from varying backgrounds, come together, get to listen to each other in locker rooms. 
And I think they have the ability to, to really know the significance of what this is doing to their communities. And I also think a positive thing too, and, and we're starting to see a little bit is these league owners, uh, the team owners and, and the leagues themselves are also being forced by these players because these players shouldn't be doing it alone uh, to, to strive for the social equity that we need too. You know, I, I wrote an article for uh, the Ounce magazine, uh, OkanaganZ.com. People can find it. And it was uh, sports plus cannabis equals healthier athletes. And and I, I really do, you know, there was a, a fictional story that started it off about a, an NHL player having a punishing night. And instead of grabbing a six pack or a Mickey, he grabs a, a CBD muffin or a THC muffin on the plane. And, and I really can't <laughs> wait to kind of see that scenario unfold at, at some point. And I know the NBA stopped testing for cannabis in the bubble and i believe they did it again uh, for the regular season uh, is there uh, one of the big four nhl nfl uh, major league baseball or the nba that you think embraces the plant as as a possible replacement for opiates first the nba will absolutely be first on all things cannabis um we've seen it already i think adam silver is the most forward-thinking commissioner of the four major leagues I think the players have demonstrated uh, a want in a way that I think ultimately the commissioner's office, the team owners will respect. And I also think it's just a more progressive league. And when I say progressive, I mean it in the American political sense. Um, it, it is the more more progressive viewership, more progressive ownership, more progressive commissioner and cannabis use, legalization, acceptance is while widely accepted well over 60 percent approval in the u.s is still sort of deemed a a progressive issue so i would say without question the nba i'd I'd be shocked if they brought back cannabis testing ever again yeah i I think uh i tend to uh, agree with you in in that sense all right uh, we always like to wrap up with uh, the same question and by the way uh, dan and i are going to continue the conversation on uh, relevant on the cannabis 101 vibe on thursday 5 30 p.m eastern time 3 30 p.m mountain time where i am and of course 2 30 p.m uh, pacific time so we'll continue the conversation about sports uh, entertainers uh, cannabis and uh, some cool things at green lane but dan what do you think is the next big thing in cannabis here in canada we you know we're going to be coming up in the fall to our third anniversary and there's lots of things that people would like to see here in canada but what do you think is the next big thing whether it's in the u.s or, or maybe globally So I'll say I'll I'll focus on the U.S. and I'll break it down into two answers. I'll say one on the product uh, consumer side and then one kind of on a more regulatory general side. On the product side, I think the in-person consumption lounge, when everything from COVID settles down, is actually going to be a huge thing. I think it's tough to look at it through the lens of the last 14, 15 months for all obvious reasons. But I think you're going to see a different type of young adult, adult in general, who is not going to want to necessarily go back to some of the bar, classic bar behavior, whether it's sports bar, whether it's just classic alcohol, friends, meeting a significant other bar. And I think you're going to see these quasi consumption lounges, restaurant cannabis lounges, uh, movie theater lounges. I think all of these classic bars, restaurants, things of that nature are going to look to differentiate. I think that's going to be big. I think on the regulatory front, I think the the, um, criminal justice component is really going to take a huge next step. I think you're seeing it with New York. They made such a concerted effort. I think you're going to see it wipe through the entire country. I think, unfortunately, um, and very sadly, there was another shooting um, in the United States of an, an unarmed young um, African-American male. And I think one way that we've seen, which is insufficient, but one way that we've seen that unites everyone around criminal justice and police reform is ending the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I, I don't want things like that to be the reason that it happens, I think it's one thing that can bring everyone together around criminal justice reform. And I think it's hopefully over the next year going to take a big step forward. 
Yeah, hopefully that, uh, you know, and, and I've said kind of uh, legalization in Canada is great because I can go to the store and get a joint and come home. Nobody's calling the cops on me. Um, you know, two of the big things, and, and I used to only think about one of them until recently, but two of the big things that are going to be the biggest benefactor in legalization is the research that is being done and um, the criminal justice reform. People that had their lives destroyed because they were smoking a joint, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some of that back and, and for the future, people won't have to go through the same thing. And so those are the two things I think that ultimately are going to be the biggest thing is the more we know about the plant, the more benefits we can get from it and giving people hopefully some of their lives back because of, uh, you know, unjust uh, criminal laws around the plant. Yeah, the United States, the best research institutions in the United States, some of the best universities in the world can't do research on the plant because it's federally illegal. And it is the equivalent of them doing research on heroin next to their chemistry lab. And it is it is such a loss for humanity at large when you see what's coming out of places like Israel from a research and development perspective, what we can do. And I'm hopeful we get there. Yeah, we have a guest uh, on a future show lined up who does research on cannabis, and, and that kind of analogy is it's almost easier to get heroin than it is to get cannabis when, when you're doing research. And that's in the country uh, where it's uh, federally legal, but uh, certainly that's for uh, another episode. Uh, so you can find information about Green Lane at www.gnln.com. Check out the cool brands that they represent and uh, see what else is going on. Dan, this has been so much, uh, so enlightening i can't wait to keep the conversation going on thursday on relevant on the cannabis 101 podcast vibe thank you so much and uh enjoy the uh, the hockey playoffs when you get there in uh, in florida you guys should have some fun this year likewise thank you so much for having me the the rangers are fun uh I, i'm hopeful the the post hank era is as exciting but it's it's tough to not see him in the net i have to be honest <laughs> This is the Cannabis 101 Podcast, part of the Cannabis Life Experience, turning the wheel of cannabis one toke at a time. That was so much fun. Uh, I can't wait for you to hear one hitters as well. Uh, some really cool stuff with Dan. And I really can't wait to continue the conversation on uh, April 15th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. 2.30 p.m. Pacific on the Relevant app. Just uh, download the app. It's uh, very simple. Uh, Relevant is, uh, by the way, spelled R-E-L-E-V-N-T, and then find the Cannabis 101 podcast vibe. But we are going to be doing one-hitters with Dan, and it will come out on the weekend, uh, so sometime uh, between uh, April 15th and April 17th. You can find it and full episodes at Cannabis101podcast.ca where you can subscribe to the Weed Weekly and qualify for our Friday giveaway. Who grew it? What's the terpene profile? Who created it? What is the lineage? How much THC? What's in a name? This is Know Your Buds, a close-up look at cultivars you should try. Or try again. Joining Dean is our educator, Chris Ionson. Love getting the chance to explore more great cannabis on Know Your Buds as I will bring in our educator and regional manager with Plant Life Cannabis, Chris Ionson. You can find more information at www.plantlifecannabis.com. And there will be lots of 420 specials for next week uh, that we will discuss as we go along in the show. But Chris, how are things in the plant life world today? Uh, buddy, they're doing they're doing great. Uh, I, I spent my day out in the Fort Saskatchewan store mm -hmm. uh, working out there with the, the boys out there and they're Always a blast to, to see and, and hang out with. They're all very passionate, uh, enthusiastic cannabis consumers. So we always have a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> 
I uh, stopped by today to pick up the uh, cultivar that we're going with tonight. Uh, I love that storefront. Good to meet Maddie, who was working out there. But that storefront really has a presence on that kind of corner lot. It does, yeah, for sure. It's a nice corner corner unit there. It's a, it's a very large uh, store inside too. When you do come in, I do hear that from people coming in, and being like, "Holy crap! I didn't expect it to be this big." Uh, but uh, definitely one of our, you know, uh, to me, it's, a, it's one of our nicer stores. I, I like just walking in there and just the, the vibe you get in there is uh, is great. Indeed. Uh, looking forward to chatting about this cultivar tonight. We are doing uh, Strawberry Glue, an Indica dominant hybrid on the uh, 6040 side. And, and as, as we're going to find out and as we're going to tell you, certainly didn't act like uh, what people think an indica should. Now, it's an indica-dominant hybrid, and it uh, is very, very close at 60-40. So just proof that just because you see that I uh, or an S for indica or sativa doesn't exactly mean you're going to be couch-locked or uh, bouncing off the walls, so to speak. So the LP in this one, Chris, is Namaste, and they are the rec brand of Xenobis. So give us a little bit about their background. Yeah, Dino. So Xenobis was founded in 2013, uh, they were originally originally named uh, the International Herbs Medical Marijuana uh, Limited. That was the company name. <laughs> uh, they did change it up uh, after that. Uh, after that, uh, it was co-founded by uh, Monty Sica and Mark Ketropa, and uh, and they purchased their first facility in 2014 in New Brunswick, and then received their uh, cultivation license from Health Canada in 2017. Um, the company is currently run by CEO Shai Altman. And their head office is out of Vancouver, BC. All right. And so recently there was some big, big news when it came to Namaste and an acquisition. That's right. Uh, yeah. So Namaste and the Xenobis uh, Global, the, the company, uh, uh, there was a recent acquisition of, of that that company from uh, the Quebec cannabis uh, giants, Hexo. So Hexo uh, has acquired uh, Xenobis. Uh, as a whole, and they're going to be kind of uh, working together. The, the brands are still going to be uh, out there, but there was just an acquisition. Uh, we've kind of seen this happening quite a bit late, lately in the cannabis space, so uh, nothing too, too crazy, but uh, kind of exciting news to see two, two really good companies kind of uh, merge and, and form one. Yeah, and, and you're right. We are seeing this uh, quite a lot. Uh, you know, Canopy Growth just grabbing uh, Supreme, and and I think we're going to see it a, a lot more. And in some of the bigger companies, are recognize some of the smaller craft comp- uh, cannabis companies that could be really beneficial for them as well. So, uh, what about the brands under Xenobis? So the brands under Xenobis, uh, Xenobis is actually their medical side. So there is a Xenobis. Uh, medical brand that's out there for their patients, medical patients. Uh, in the Canadian rec market, we are seeing uh, Namaste, which is the the rec brand. Uh, there is Blazery, uh, which is a pre-roll brand that I, I we have yet to see in Alberta, hopefully soon, but I, it's been in Ontario and it's done really well out there. Uh, and then there's also the Reup, uh, which is a very, very popular brand right now. And it's uh, it's bulk options to compete with the legacy market pricing. And uh, it's very aggressively priced, and it, it sells really, really well. And it's always the freshest ounce bags we got, uh, typically. So uh, kudos to the Reup brand. Yeah, affordable ounces. Uh, you know, when those started coming out, it, it was really. I think. I think that was a really important thing for people that like to buy in bulk. Uh, like a lot of people did uh, on the uh, the black market or the legacy market. So that was definitely a step forward in the cannabis industry, I think, in, in getting people to say, you know what, I am going to buy legally because I, I can get uh, the affordable uh, cannabis in the proper size uh, that, I, that I want to get. So tell us a little bit about uh, the facility. I always love the backgrounds on the LPs we're talking to and, you know, how big it is, how they grow. Give us the lowdown on how they get it done. For sure, buddy. So Xenobis has a, a massive 380,000 square foot facility. Uh, it's an indoor facility in Atholville, New Brunswick. Uh, and they also have indoor facilities in Delta, BC and Stellarton, New Brunswick as well. Uh, in total, they have uh, just over 3.5 million square feet of growth space if needed. And uh, so all kinds of room for growth with this company uh, and how they grow is, is quite the process too. Um, it all starts with their optimized environmental, uh, environmentally controlled rooms. So uh, temperature, humidity, uh, CO2, that's all factored into uh, each room and, and what cultivars being grown in that room. 
Um, it's a tailored nutrient regime, so uh, very sustain uh, like sustainably sourced coconut husk and, and peat moss from New Brunswick. Um, they also use uh, reverse osmosis filtered water and uh, a mineral-based fertilizer. So um, very kind of on point with, uh, I guess, the, the taking care of the plant and feeding the plants. Uh, as well as ideal lighting conditions. So they use LED and HPS lighting and HPS is the high pressure sodium lights and uh, those those big bulbs that get really hot, uh, but are great, great, great for, for uh, the cannabis plant in its flowering state. Um, there's also non-chemical pest management. So they have natural predators uh, instead of, you know, the chemical pesticides that we don't ever want to see in our in our buds. Uh, and then everything is, is harvested and trimmed by hand. So uh, more human power. Uh, again, we like to see that too. Uh, it just just matters. It makes the bud quality a little bit nicer. And when someone's picking through um, your buds to kind of like load up your jars, uh, I find a lot of times like if someone smokes and they look at it like, you know what, I wouldn't want this in my jar. Mm -hmm. It gets discarded instead of, you know, a machine being like, well, this weighed 3.5 grams, load it in. Um, so, yeah, with with the whole Namaste brand, uh, Dino, I've been a big fan for quite a bit since they first, first came out. Uh, they offer a lot of, like, excellent quality bud uh, for a great price, too. Uh, their D-Bubba, their 24 karat gold are two of my go-tos that I get on the regular. Um, and I got to give a big shout out uh, to a good friend of mine. Uh, Pinky, uh, Elena Linterman, she is the, the Namaste rep here in Northern Alberta. Um, she is an absolute beauty, uh, very, very passionate about weed uh, for sure. And actually her and I go way back to, we got our, our, our beginnings in the cannabis industry together uh, with, with Nova Cannabis uh, pre-legalization. So uh, she's definitely an old friend and she definitely hooked up some awesome information. And uh, so huge shout out. Thank you, Pinky. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much to uh, Pinky uh, for myself as well. The, the website is uh, namaste.ca. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't get past the age gating with this program, so can't tell you about it. But uh, they do have some uh, decent information on there. I, I didn't couldn't find strawberry glue on there, of, of all things, but uh, maybe just a, a glitch in the system. But uh, they do have some uh, decent information on uh, you know the cultivars and, and some of the background on that. So uh, you can check that out at Namaste. Dot .ca uh, give us the uh, information on uh, the history and the lineage of strawberry glue for sure buddy so uh, the lineage of strawberry glue is uh, strawberry diesel uh, crossed with uh, the legendary gorilla glue number 4 uh, and so with the strawberry diesel we've got it's a strawberry cough crossed with a sour diesel and with the gorilla glue it's uh, it's kind of a three way cross of sour dub chem sister and chocolate diesel um, and it was initially like the strawberry uh, glue that we've got here is initially bred by Dark Horse Genetics. Um, but what we should talk about, Dino, is, is the Gorilla Glue. Um, it was created by uh, the cannabis legend uh, Josie Wales. Uh, his real name was Don. Uh, and he actually created Gorilla Glue number four in, in 2014 uh, at the spry age of 63. So this guy was in his 60s still um messing with genetics and 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 you know uh, trying to pump out some new cultivars and uh him and his partner uh lone wadi were messing around with uh crossing some diesels and some chems and according to folklore uh you know they, they came across this uh, gorilla glue number four and the resin from that very first batch uh, of the original glue uh had the accidental effect of gluing the phone receiver to josie's hand um <laughs> It just the image of that I'm just picturing, uh, you know, and, and I, I've noticed that when I've been in some some facilities and I've handled some buds, you, you your fingers uh, get so so sticky. So um, love love that story for sure. Um, however, uh, tragic news though uh, it happened uh, a little while ago, but uh, I'm gonna we're gonna bring it up and talk about it. Uh, uh, we lost Josie Wales uh, May 6th of 2020 uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, due to some complications he had from a fall. Uh, he was 69 years old, and the cannabis industry really, really felt that one. Um, I remember seeing it a whole bunch in, in my uh, social media feeds, just everyone kind of giving a shout-out to the guy. Uh, he was a true cannabis legend, and he was absolutely humble about it. You know, whenever people would get to meet the guy and say, man, Gorilla Glue number four, that's my jam, uh, he would never take the fame or, or the credits. He would always just kind of um, – 
credit the plant and say it's it's all the plant it wasn't me um so uh true legend one of the people i guess he would have been on my list of people i'd like to you know smoke a joint with um and uh yeah he's uh, a legend so um uh, sucks that we lost him there but uh how things have been going i I guess unfortunately but uh a true le- cannabis legend i love uh the the josie wales um you know i i'm guessing that's a nod to the classic clint eastwood uh western outlaw josie wales uh it's great um i'm actually now planning on uh rolling up some of this having a relaxing night watching outlaw josie wales after we finish and and you know, just, just I brought out the uh, the Hexasaurus Rex here. Uh, you know, going back in time, uh, I, I'm not sure if this is what I used when I lit the mic on fire that time. But as uh, as a tribute to uh, Don uh, Josie Wales, I'm going to do a little hit on this as uh, you talk a little bit about uh, the THC and uh, the genetic name, uh, the the what's in a name. For sure, buddy. So uh, with the, with the batch that we got today, it's a 19.2 percent THC. Um, or as it's listed on the jar, uh, 192 milligrams per gram. Uh, so we're, we're starting to see kind of b- both of those now. Uh, with the name Dino, uh, Strawberry Glue, it's pretty much a genetic name here. We've got Strawberry Diesel mm-hmm. crossed with Gorilla Glue. I mean, uh, the other option maybe would have been call it Diesel Gorilla or Gorilla Diesel. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, with the flavor too. Uh, it's definitely noticeable in the flavor that it is kind of got that sweet berry berry to it. So uh, strawberry glue kind of made sense uh, genetically. Indeed. All right. Let's take a look at uh, the packaging. Uh, we've got uh, a shot of uh, the, the white packaging. And this is pretty good size, eh? It is. It's a great size for a 3.5 um, for sure. I'm a big fan of it. It's It's one of the smaller 3.5 tubs that we have you know, in our stores and, uh, yeah, it works out great. I, I also like to with Namaste. So with their, their, their strains, uh, their, their cultivars, pardon me. Uh, it's all different colors. Uh, so the strawberry glue is red. The 24 karat gold is yellow. Uh, the D Bubba is blue. Uh, so it makes a, a bud tenders job easy too, just keeping things very separate, uh, and less of a chance of like a, a miss punch or a miss, a miss ring in. Well, and you you know my philosophy on that as well as as we've talked about, it stands out uh, better to the customer yeah. uh, in the uh, store shelves and, and in the glass casings as well. Um, what do you like about? Uh, oh, first of all, we should say there was no humidity pack, uh, so that's a tough one, um, and there was a lip, so that's a tough one. But this cannabis is in good shape. Uh, but uh, my call to action for every LP out there: please include a humidity pack. And Chris and I would love to get rid of the lips in the packaging, but all in all, the tub is good. What do you see when you look yeah. at the buds? For sure. So uh, darker buds, uh, kind of uh, multiple shades of green, uh, real nice dusting of trichomes on the buds as well. Um, the the jar that I had, uh, was I was super happy with it. Uh, the one, maybe my one complaint would be that the trim job could just be done a little bit better. I had a, I had one just big stick, just alone sticking in the jar there. So uh, maybe the human that was sorting it was uh, <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a smoke break, uh, you know, before sorting mine or, or something like that. But uh, uh, overall, uh, I, I like it. I mean, you, you grind it up. Smoke with smoke, and it's it's that's what you're looking for for sure. Uh, is the end effect, yeah. It's uh, I, the the trim job on this one, it, it could be better. It's not the worst that I've seen. It, you know, it wasn't trimmed with a butter knife or anything like that, but uh, there were a little bit of leaves on there. But the look of it, I love it. Uh, you know, the, you've got some really, really dark and some really, really light greens as well. Uh, okay, let's dive into the terpene profile with this one. Yeah, so uh, terps on this one, we got caryophyllene, our dominant one, and that's black pepper and spice. Uh, it's Dino's favorite. Uh, Myrcene is, is next, and that's uh, kind of an earthy smell and aroma. Uh, it's found in uh, mangoes, too. Uh, it's very common, though. We're, we're you know seeing myrcene in a lot of the rec market uh, cultivars out there. Uh, and then humulene is, is the third one there, and we don't talk about humulene uh, too, too much, and that's uh, kind of a hoppy, a woody uh, aroma and flavor to it, uh, and it's, it's found in hops and, and in beer uh, as well. And that leads us to the taste, uh, because obviously uh, that terpenes are those aromatic oils uh, that affect not just the smell, but also with the entourage effect, uh, with THC and with uh, different cannabinoids, CBD, 
uh, it contributes. Uh, so what are you getting from the smell on this? What's your, what's your nose tell you? So for me, it was uh, definitely sweet uh, initially, sweet and gassy. Uh, and the sweet that I got was kind of like a berry fruity sweetness. And that gassy was kind of, yeah, very diesel-y. It just reminded me of some of the diesel strains that I've I've seen. And that, I guess, makes sense with the, uh, the genetic breakdown. Um, I did get a bit of a glue smell to it, too. Uh, and I've, I've had that when I smelt the pre-rolls and the bud as well. Yeah, you know, I grabbed some pre-rolls today when I was out at... Uh... At the fort, uh, and and I really did get, um, you know, even off of the pre rolls, I've got that berry smell. Like it's just, uh, like just a sweet fruity smell. So, so I definitely agree with that. What about the taste? Uh, I'm getting some uh, some of that caryophylline, uh, that that spicy. What what are you getting on the taste? Oh, for sure, buddy. It's uh, it's a spicy gas for that initial pull. Uh, now, I, I consumed uh, mine in, in joints. That's just my go-to. Uh, definitely spicy gas in that initial pull, um, and then a sweetness uh, coming out on the exhale, uh, but really smooth, enjoyable smoke. Yeah, it, it yeah. is. You know, I, I haven't uh, used the uh, Hexasaurus Rex uh, in, in, you know, it's been quite a while. I've been uh, doing a lot of vaping, but I wanted to, to pull this uh, something different out tonight and try it out, and... You know, for, for not having uh, used this bong in a long time and just the only time I've lit anything has been in, in a joint, it is a very smooth, smooth taste. And, you know, if you're watching, you can see some of those really uh, beautiful different kind of colors uh, that are on there. So definitely love the spiciness. That's, you know, my go-to. It's also beneficial for me on the uh, the mental health side. And I know you guys are only recreational, but, you know, I can speak for myself of the caryophylline. Uh, myrcene, limonene being some of the terpenes that I've been targeting to try and help with my mood and, and some of the things like that. So this is definitely one that I can't wait to dive into a little bit more and, uh, you know, grab some more and really take uh, note of my experiences, uh, which leads us to your experience. Uh, what do you get with this, Chris? Because everybody is a little bit different. So what is your experience? It's it's a good one. I uh, I, I really, really, really like the strawberry glue. Uh, and I've been kind of shouting it from the mountaintops uh, whenever I'm in store. Uh, and I've shared that with a lot of people. And a lot of people have come back to me saying, you were right uh, about that one. So it started with me with the, the pre-rolls. I just started to get those three packs quite often, uh, like end of every one of the shifts that I would, I'd be working at a one store. And I just found the mood that it puts me in, super uplifted. Um, and it's kind of like an indica that, or an indica dom hybrid that acts like a sativa. There's there's an initial kind of burst of like good times, smiles, uh, and it, it's it's noticeable. Um, also puts me in a really like a dancey mood. That that's gonna sound. I'm not a big dancing guy, but uh, I find that I you know I'm at home alone. I've smoked. I put a strawberry glue out, and I'm in my kitchen, and the, you know the TV's on. I'm just in a great mood. Um, it just really brings it out of me and, um, everyone that I've told to is like, yep, me too. It's, it's definitely worth checking out. I was so excited, uh, when we, we talked about doing this one, Dean, cause, uh, it is one of my go-tos. Um, so th that initial kind of euphoric uplifted head buzz, uh, kind of eventually melts into this super relaxing, uh, body stone, um, that is a real nice combo. It's, um, Big fan. I love it. <laughs> you know, I I, uh, I grabbed this uh, pre-roll earlier today, w w the pre-rolls, and, and I had one of them. And I didn't do it, look uh, at a lot of the things, the information. And I would have told you if you would have asked me that it was, uh, you know, a, a pretty, uh, you know, strong on the sativa side. Because I got that initial burst like you're talking about. I felt great. I got some work done. It was really, yeah. really interesting. And so, you know, it, you know, it's very, very important for people to realize just because it's an indica doesn't mean it's going to put you on the couch. And just because it's a sativa doesn't mean you're going to be talking oh, yeah. a mile a minute. And this is pretty much as close almost as you can get between, uh, you know, the 50-50 the split being 60-40. So uh, I, I loved it uh, this afternoon. And uh, that leads us to the three W's. Who, what, and when do we think this is good for? Keeping in mind, everybody does react differently. 
Totally. So who it's good for? I think this is a level two consumer. Uh, I think if you've been in the level one zone for a bit and you were looking for the next step, I'd say hit this one. I'd say get into it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I don't think there's going to be, uh, you know, too, too much head anxiety coming from, from this one. Uh, what it's good for turning that frown upside down. Uh, it is very uplifting. Um, it is great for, you know, uh, getting home from work and that's your first joint of like, you had a long day at work. It is great for that. Um, right after dinner, it's amazing. Uh, pretty much right after anything you want, uh, works for me. I, big big fan of this one uh which also leads into when and for me it, it's another one that's any time of day is good for me um i've definitely started my day wake and bake with some strawberry glue and i've still gotten stuff done i still chilled a bit it was a really nice mix it wasn't too too chill um so it's definitely a, a all day uh cultivar for me do you know I'm starting to feel that as well. It was a really, really nice one uh, this afternoon uh, for, for me as well. Okay, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, Strawberry Glue by Namaste. It's a really, really great one. Like, I could see, you know, this one being another one of those uh, kind of camping cultivars that, you know, you have during the day, you, you have some fun, and then you kind of chill in to relax into something around the fire. Like, almost like... You know, right after dinner when it's still kind of light out and then you're kind of chilling out into the dark. I, I really am looking forward to grabbing this on some of the camping trips. Hopefully we get to go on some camping trips uh, this year. But I do know that next week is a big one. Obviously, Tuesday is 420. Um, you know, again, we can't celebrate like we normally would, but we can still celebrate on our own and you can still celebrate with good deals. And I know you guys are going to have some of those uh, next week, particularly on Tuesday. Yeah, totally, Dino. It's uh, actually we're doing it the whole week of, of 420, so that starts uh, on Monday the 19th there. Um, great, great kind of deals uh, for, for all of our guests on, on cannabis accessories. Uh, worth checking out. And actually on, on the 420, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be doing a, a countdown in store for anybody's in there and celebrate it kind of like New Year's Eve, uh, you know, with a happy 420. It's, uh, no, it's worth celebrating uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, it's, it's always going to be uh, a good time in our shops. Uh, you know, we're all uh, going to be there working uh, there to serve you guys. So uh, yeah, come on down, check us out for 420. Yeah, it's going to be so exciting and people can uh, click and collect, uh, pay, uh, order ahead, find out uh, what's going on at your particular Plant Life location. You can find that at plantlifecannabis.com. As always, Chris, this has been so enjoyable. I've got a Western to go watch uh, with a, uh, a little strawberry glue. So have a great rest of your night. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. You too. Enjoy the movie. The Cannabis Life Experience. It's not just about getting high. It's about getting healthy. Turning the wheel of cannabis, one toke at a time. All right, another delicious cultivar on the menu. Uh, man, 90 of these we have done, plus the amount we did for the 12 uh, cultivars of Christmas the last two years. It has been a wild ride, and I can't wait for the next 90, 100 uh, 500 episodes, however long we can keep this show going. I cannot wait uh, to uh, keep bringing you uh, great cultivars that you should be trying. Uh, as mentioned before, thank you very much for watching. If you are on our YouTube channel, uh, just click the subscribe button, hit the bell. You'll get notified every time we put something out, which is every day at 4.20 a.m., sometimes twice a day as well. If you're listening, I'd appreciate to subscribe. And please review. Let us know what you think of the show. Uh, please, it's very important to us. And if you'd like to help us out, we do have a Patreon account. You can find it on our website at cannabis101podcast.ca. Um, as you may or may not know, the regulations surrounding uh, advertising and cannabis are very strict in that you can't. Uh, so we do have some great partners in the OZ and uh, the Green Generation Co. that support us. Uh, Stonesmiths, when they were, uh, you know, actively out there, they they supported us with uh, their their 
knowledge, their information, their contacts. So that that's how you get partners in the cannabis industry is that you share and you push it forward. Uh, but you can't do any kind of advertising. So if you would like to help us out, we would uh, love any help that comes uh, our way. Of course, we know times are extremely tough and definitely not necessary. We would never want to charge uh, for the information that we do get, uh, but certainly any kind of help is welcome so enjoy the show subscribe to the show and leave a review to the show and head to the website and sign up for the weed weekly that green circle on the right just click on that and you're in the mix for our prize pack every week but it's only for subscribers uh, so it's also an easy way to catch up on the show. If you did miss anything uh, during the week, uh, we recap things uh, for sure. Um, and also, if you're into other podcasts, check out Podcast Alley. It's where we host everything uh, from Tracking the Draft with Craig Button that's geared towards the National Hockey League, Fantasy Hockey Time. Uh, obviously, past episodes of this show can be linked up there. The cannabis needs its own website, though, because of the age-gating rules, and we want to be abiding by that. And uh, we might have some more shows to add to the mix. Uh, Sports and more is a little bit dormant right now just because we've had a few other things uh, going on as well. So if you would uh, like to get in the mix and uh, find out some other shows, check out podcastalley.ca. Uh, and if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can through the websites or you can email me cannabis101podcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to be a partner and uh, join the fun, or if you would just like to be a guest, or if you just have a comment about the show or a question, love hearing uh, from people that do enjoy the show. We're back at it on Tuesday with a brand new episode. David Wiley from the OZ on This Week in Cannabis News. Malka LaBelle from the Green Generation Co. on the business of cannabis We'll have another cannabis character. This week's was from Half Baked. We'll have more weed words of the day, another cannabis question, and we'll give you information uh, and more about the Weed Weekly. So that is just about going to wrap things up for us on the program this week. Uh, thank you so much to Dan Shapiro for joining me uh, from Florida. Uh, as mentioned, we'll continue the conversation on Relevant at the Cannabis 101 Podcast Vibe. April 15th at uh, 5.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. Pacific. And, of course, uh, Chris Ionson, our regional manager with Plant Life Cannabis, and our educator, uh, Strawberry Glue, was absolutely delicious. All right, as we always do, we're going to leave you with the Marijuana song from the artist Sorry About Your Dog. And remember, it's not just about getting high, it's about getting healthy. Uh, individual segments rather start coming out on Thursday, April 15th. Have a great rest of your week in cannabis. See you later, everybody.